Um, when we were looking at the passage in, in Acts 9, he had gotten saved. He had gone out into, um, or actually he had been left down in a basket uh, from Damascus. They had to, they had made the people there so mad that they lowered him in a basket down a window in the wall at night with a rope, and he escaped. And he went out to Arabia, what I call the synagogue of sand. And he just went with scriptures, and he went to, he had always been taught one thing, but now he's saved. And, and now he has the Holy Spirit living within him. And now he's going to to, to relook at the scriptures in a new light. And he spends three years doing that. He comes back to Damascus and, and he is there with them for a moment. And then he tries to join up with the disciples, the apostles in um, Jerusalem. So that's where we uh, were when we uh, skipped that paragraph in Acts chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles in Acts chapter 9, verse number 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. Hold on. I left out a word. It's a very important word. All. In the Greek, it is J. We got news. We got things popping up all over the place. Noises from heaven. The, the, in the Greek, it is J O E. You pronounce that however you want to, but it is the word all. I say that because all means all, and that's all, all means, and that's what this word says. So literally, he is saying that every apostle, believer in the inner crowd in Jerusalem, wanted to have nothing to do with Saul. Can I just pause here and say that this is the person that God saved, God cleansed, and even in the earlier part of Acts 9, when he's talking about him, he's talking about how much God was going to use him, how much he was going to have to suffer for Jesus' sake, so that the good news of Jesus Christ would go out into all the world, to the Gentiles. He would be an apostle to the Gentiles. But they wanted nothing to do with him. All of them were afraid of him because of his old life because of his reputation. Isn't it funny how we look at people and we judge them by what we think rather than what God thinks? Or skid I say, rather than what God knows. We look at someone and we have this great ability to measure them up and find the good in them and find the bad in them and then we decide whether we want to have anything to do with him or not. This is somebody who got cleansed. This is somebody who had regret, repentance. How bad did Saul feel because he was such one who was such a zealot that he was persecuting the church, the followers of Christ. He was there when Stephen was stoned. Now, he's on the, the same side that Stephen was on in looking to God. Bible says that he consented to Stephen's death. Now that burning, churning of self-condemnation. And he's finding the grace of the glorious God, Jesus Christ. Aren't you grateful that God answers in grace? But come on, church. Aren't you grateful that he also gives us mercy too? That's when we don't get what we deserve. We get better. And yet, in the world today, as it was in that day, we judge who we're going to give grace to, and we judge who we're going to give mercy to. We decide who we will love and who we will not love. We will decide who we will have relationships with and who we will not want to have anything to do with. And that's about us. The old saying is, birds of a feather flock together. So we go where we're comfortable. We approve of the ones we disapprove of. And the ones that we disapprove of, we just write them off. I heard something this week, and I thought, I need to remember that. It made a statement. It said, how come we can go to McDonald's 
and they get our order wrong a hundred times in a row, and we keep going back. But somebody else will say something that we disagree with them, and we don't want to talk to them ever again. Is that the truth? And here, it's the apostles, the vessels, literally the anointed ones, that God would show Himself in His glory through them. And yet, they were part of this same sickness of disapproval. How many times shall we forgive someone? Matthew 18 says that we should forgive them up to 70 times 7. And that's not saying 490 times. And I will promise you, if you've got a card and you're take, keeping a count, that's the 286th time that person's forget, uh, hurt me and I'm going to forgive them again. But they're getting closer to the end. You've got a different problem. He is saying an infinite amount of times. But yet in our society today, the society that has more than any country in the history of the world, the people in our society that have the least amount have more than in other societies in our world today. Matter of fact, in some places they would be considered rich. And yet we have so much to the point that we have become so, I want, you know, there are sins of commission. That's the things that we know that we do. But there are other sins of omission, the things that we should do that we don't do. And I think we should give grace. I think we should be people of mercy. We're very grateful for what God has done for us, but we're not very willing to give it to someone else unless we choose to. Where's the divide? Where do we have the right to receive the glorious touch of the love of God but withhold it from anybody we so choose to? Well, in this scene, all were afraid. They did not believe that he was a disciple. I mean, they had already figured this thing out. He's a spy to come in and take us and get us and throw us in jail. Isn't it funny how we can speculate? You may not have heard this. You may not like this. But folks, it's the truth. Your speculation is sin. We're to be people of truth, not innuendos. And when you don't know, choose the good, not the bad. Choose to think the best, not the worst. We may have the most of any country in the world, but we are the greatest judges. And then in verse 27, somebody walks in, and his name is Barnabas. Actually, his name is Joseph. Barnabas is his nickname. You remember that? We found that in, in, in Acts, Acts 5. It means the son of encouragement. When they looked at this guy that we now know as Barnabas, they looked at him and said, you know, every time I'm around him, I feel encouraged. He's always loving on people. He's always trying to build people up. Have y'all ever been around the people who are the sons of discouragement? The cold water committee? The ones who are the greatest gossips in the world? The one who always have something negative to say about any situation? Do y'all know those people? How many of y'all on Facebook? You've met them. They're everywhere. And how is it people who supposedly love each other can get mad at each other? I've told y'all this before. It's one of the most amazing things. After someone passed away, the kids broke and never talked to each other again over a salt and pepper shaker who got what? A salt and pepper shaker had more value to them than their loved one. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, steps in, and he took him and brought him to the apostles. Now, it doesn't say anything about how he got to know Saul. I wonder if when 
the, the, the other apostles wanted to push him out, slam the door, have nothing to do with him, not even have a conversation. If Barnabas said, you know, I'd like to talk to that young man. And he knew his story, so somehow he got to know him. Maybe Saul approached him, I don't know. Maybe Barnabas approached him. But now he knows him, and he says he took him, brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them. That word declare means he, he, he spoke on behalf with authority. He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Look, Saul's not having to defend himself. Barnabas he is. Praise God to have a friend like that. Sometimes we can't defend ourselves. But at least he had a friend, Barnabas, who would. And there may be somebody out there that can't defend themselves. And maybe they need a, a friend like you to come to defend them. Instead of joining in the gossip and the speculation and the disappointment. Church, I'm talking to you. Maybe we need to raise the water for the rest of our culture. Maybe we need to be the light, the example Maybe we need to be the ones to put ourselves out there and go. How did Saul feel when he had been spending three years covering the Scriptures out there, wanting to know the things of God? And now he comes, and he, he with joy, he's wanting to join them and learn from them and have fellowship with them. And he gets a door slammed in his face. How must he have felt? Praise God for somebody who was a brother the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, let me skip over in my notes. It says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A man who has friends, Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must be uh, himself be friendly. Listen, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's put this in context. Solomon, in writing the proverb, is not talking about the Messiah. He's talking about a friend. That's someone like me and you. He said, it's good to have family, but it's good to have a friend who will be a friend at all times who will actually do more for you than a family member, than a brother. How many of you are closer to someone else than even your own family? It's easy to do. It's easy to be. You can't, we don't choose our family, right? But we do choose our friends. And, and listen, church, please hear this. Blessed is the one who has such a friend. Jesus Matthew 11 was said to be a friend of sinners. The word love in their language, storgos, meant I love one with a brotherly love, a friendly love because they can do something for me. Phileo, brotherly love that says I love them because I get a benefit from it. But what if we don't get a benefit? What if we love them even we don't, when we don't personally get something back out of it? That's agape. And praise God that there are people that can come around us to bless us with a godly love. Well, verse number 28. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. They got to know him. And they liked him. Verse 29. Now, you have to remember, his reputation was he was a zealot. He was passionate. He was going to not just talk the talk. He was going to walk the walk. He was the one who took the anti-Christian movement to the zenith. Now he's a Christian, and he's going to take that to the zenith too. So in verse 29, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed among the Hellenists, and they attempted to kill him. I mean, he just made those people so mad. He's not smooth yet, right? He's like a ball bat. He's going to love them in Jesus' name. Bam, get saved, right? And they're ready to kill him. That's good company. Didn't they want to kill Jesus too? 
But the other disciples like that, man, what are we going to do about this guy? Everywhere he goes, he's causing a fight. Let me skip a verse and go to verse 31. In verse 31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Is that a good news? Now let's go back a verse and see what happened before the peace. Verse 30, When the brethren found out, that is about Saul out there speaking and making everybody mad, they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him out to Tarsus. They sent him home. Hey, Saul, appreciate you, love you. Why don't you go home? I heard a preacher say one time, they sent him back to mama. And there he stayed for nearly a decade. We don't know what went on in Tarsus. But he's not the world of he's not the world missionary yet. Look over in chapter eleven, verse number nineteen. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but to the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, that is the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great uh, number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They're like, hey, people are getting saved. Greek people are getting saved. Now remember, earlier in chapter 11, Peter's out there, and, and, and Cornelius, a Gentile, gets saved, Right? Now they're finding out that Gentiles are getting saved everywhere. So what are they going to do? Verse 22, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. They, they said, we need to find out what's, what the bottom of this is. Praise God they picked the right guy. Come, go, go find out what's going on and report back to me. Okay, verse 23. And when he had seen the grace of God, this is Barnabas, he was glad and encouraged them. Boy. Amen. Everybody else didn't know what y'all are doing. I think what y'all are doing is great. Keep it up. God loves you. God blesses you. Your ministry is good. He's not saying, hold on now. You need to do this. You need to do this. Make sure you do this. Make sure you get your reports into Jerusalem on time. He's just saying, praise God. This is a good thing. He's not saying you're getting out of order. We didn't give you permission. No, he's just encouraging them. <clears throat> Verse 24, here's the description of Barnabas. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. That's a good thing. Amen? Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Been almost a decade. He's there, and he's like, probably under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I would agree with this. He's like the Holy Spirit saying, hey, everybody's forgot about old Saul. He could really help you. Why don't you go get him? Barnabas is like, thanks, Lord. That's a good idea. So he stops what he's doing. He goes down to Tarsus. He seeks him, seeks him out. And then look what it says. Verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year... They assembled with the church, they, that is, uh, Barnabas and Saul, and, and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The word Christian literally means little Christ. When they saw them, they looked like Jesus. They reminded people of Jesus. Church. We have gotten ourselves into a place that we just give up on people. We don't believe in people. We don't trust people. We don't like a lot of people. But we're supposed to be the light in the world. We're supposed to be little Christ. Why are we so mad at people? And we don't even remember why we're mad at them. Why do we give up on people? Why do we only think of the negative? 
And every time something comes up, we speculate on it. Something happened to a pastor friend of mine, and I was blown away by how quickly the gossip. But he was my friend. So I reached out to him, and I said, I don't know what happened. I don't want to know what happened. I don't need to know what happened. You're my friend. I'm always going to be your friend. And if there's anything I can do to take a lyric from a Disney movie, you got a friend in me. Through thick, through thin, no matter what. Now, I will tell you that just about everybody else wrote him off. They judged him. They wrote him off. They didn't care. Hold on. How many of y'all messed up? How many of you were grateful for the mercy found in Christ? Anybody want to come up here? I'll give you a mic. We'll stay here all afternoon. You want to come confess your sins? Publicly. Let's get this stuff right. Anybody? Oh, you want to just keep them between you and the Lord? Okay, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Amen? I don't need to... I don't need to give you permission to be forgiven. God's already forgiven you. What I need to do is give you love. Not disappointment. Not judgment. Love. Today at church, I've already seen the look. Had someone tell me they were disappointed. And you know what I did? I smiled and I said, I'm sorry. And I, within 30 seconds, I think we got it worked out. Well, I tried my best. We'll see. Today, here, I'm not trying to be rude or income. I'm just saying this is how quickly I think we've allowed this to become born into our life to see something that we disagree with, and we immediately judge. My father was a good man. He was a brilliant man. He was a, he, he was a great man of God, a great preacher. He was a very consistent man. But my father, if there was a disagreement, what he would do was he would remove his love until it was worked out, if it was worked out. This is my dad. And those of you who know me, you know I love my dad unconditionally. Respect him, look up to him. But this was how I grew up. If I disapproved him, he would remove his love for me, his, his love for me, until I did whatever I had to do to get it right. I've seen it, I've lived it, and it's being taught. In church, that is prevalent. Not just in the world, but the world has snuck into us. Where are the people who will stand behind somebody no matter what? Because we've been saved, we've been cleansed, we've been loved, and we want to do for others what Christ did for us. Something's going to have to change here. We're going to have to focus in on our eyes to see in our own life and see in our own reactions. Luke 17.1 says, It is impossible that offenses do not come. I'm with you. We're going to have offenses. People will be hurt. But where do we get off judging? and not forgiving, and not loving. Hey, I'm not done. Just because I close my Bibles doesn't mean you get to close yours. You see, if we're not careful, we're going to say, good sermon, and we're going to go home, and there's going to be no change. And it's going to take two people 
for there to be change here. One of them's Christ, and He's very willing. And the other one's you. And I don't know how willing you are. But when you look into the glorious grace of God, who has done everything for you, you should be grateful. You should be so thrilled that you don't have to come up here and grab a mic and spill the beans on all your sins in your life. The sins that you've committed and the sins that you just didn't do that you should have done. But if we can open up ourselves to quit being mad, to quit being offended, to quit withholding our love, and truly be Christian like Christ, we'll be different. We'll be that friend for others that they need, and that maybe they'll be that friend for us that we need. We'll be blessed. And the world will say, what in the world's going on with those people? When I see them, they're like Christ. But this is an invitation, I believe, that should hit every soul in this room. I don't know of anybody that's perfect. I don't know of anybody that's got all this figured out. I certainly don't. And I beat myself up when I make the wrong move. You probably do too. Christ wants to bless.